Good evening and welcome to our broadcast here at Southgate. I hope that you've had a good day, Easter Sunday, and I'm certain that it has been quite different from you than what it typically has been down through the years, but it is good as Christian people that we do come together, and in a sense we are, even though we're in many, many different locations, we're coming together to share God's Word. This evening I want to start uh, with three songs. Uh, I invite you to join in and sing as we listen to When We All Get to Heaven, His Grace Reaches Me, and Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. When we conclude those three, I want to have a special prayer for some uh, requests that people have given me, and then we'll listen to the song Amazing Grace, and then I'll have a lesson and conclude with a song here this evening. So we'll this time uh, join in and singing as we look at these three songs. See no one
I've had some prayer requests come back in the last few days, and at this time I want to pray on behalf of these individuals. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. Certainly we're in some different circumstances than what we've ever seen within our country, and in fact around the world today. But we come to you at this time on behalf of some individuals that are having some health issues that also uh, want you to answer their requests. I ask that you will be with Roberta Bolton now as uh, she's got some medical issues. I know there's some improvement the last few days, but I pray that can, you'll help her to continue to improve and get better. I ask that you'll be with her sister-in-law, Patty Norman, as well. Uh, she's been in the Williamson Medical Center here the last few days, and we just ask that you'll be with her and help her as far as her health is concerned. Uh, Roberta's also got a brother, Marvin, who is uh, dealing with a, kin a skin cancer and is spreading. And we'll ask that uh, you'll be with him, be with uh, medical professions as they help uh, each of these individuals with whatever situation they find themselves in. We also ask this evening that you'll be with Donna Faye Allen. That's Larry Nicholson's sister. Her condition is worsening at this time, and I just pray that you'll continue to watch over her. Tonight, we also ask that you'll be with Matt Boyd. He's uh, been uh, diagnosed with cancer in one of his eyes. He's going to have to have surgery and radiation in order to uh, remove that cancer. We just ask that you'll be with Matt at this time. Uh, we're thankful that there's no signs of cancer anywhere else within his body. But we understand that there's a high probability he'll lose the sight of that one eye. It's our prayer tonight that... Uh, He'll be one of those rare ones that will be able to keep his vision in that eye. Our Heavenly Father, we also come to you on behalf of several others of our <coughs> congregation. I ask that you continue to be with Libby Moss as she's in the nursing home recovering from her uh, break. Uh, just continue to give her body strength and allow her to get back moving real well once again and back home. She's also got a grandson, Craig Parks that's undergoing chemo for cancer now, just a, a young fellow, but we just ask that uh, you'll alleviate those side effects, but you'll also help that cancer to disappear from his body. We ask that you'll be with uh, Sister Reba Jones, as she's just recently been in the hospital in a weakened condition, and just ask you to continue to strengthen her. I ask tonight that you'll be with all of our shut-ins. And we know that uh, our congregation has been busy and involved in spending a lot of time with uh, these individuals. They so long for that connection back to the congregation and long for people to come and talk to them. And due to these circumstances, uh, they're in isolation also. So I just ask for your comfort for them. I also ask tonight that you'll be with uh, Maurice uh, Hughes's family. That's the Brother Nancy McBee passed away this uh, last Sunday, and uh, pray be with that family as uh, they are grieving at this time. Comfort them only as you can. Our Heavenly Father, there are so many circumstances in the world around about us right now. Uh, first of all, we ask that uh, you'll give us the knowledge how to keep this virus from spreading. We also ask that you'll give us the knowledge of how that we can defeat that in the future. Our Heavenly Father, just uh, be with us as we uh, work through this and just lead us and guide us to the very best outcome we can for our nation and for the world. These are certainly trying circumstances. Help us to be patient. Uh, help us to be people that are still serving you. And Heavenly Father, we all long and are waiting for that day that we can come back together as a congregation here. And we just ask that uh, that will be at a very soon time. We know around the country there are a lot of families that are grieving because they have lost a loved one during this time. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that uh, this be a time that they'll look to you for guidance, for comfort, and that they'll seek what they can do to serve you throughout the remainder of their days that are here. Help us learn the life lesson that indeed life is short. We're going to pray all of these things through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Scripture reading this evening is found in Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I receive from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. How have you been handling the last few days? And actually it's turned into a few weeks now. Has it been a time when there's a lot of frustration? A time when uh, I think, well, this is what I'm going to go do. And then you realize that that's closed. You can't do that. You can't go here. Or you think about, well, I'd like to go out and eat my favorite restaurant, but you can't do that. There are so many changes that have taken place. Has it been just a total frustration to you? Are you losing patience? Or is there a contentedness about you? Paul talked about contentment in this passage that we've just read. And I want to talk about that idea of contentment. He said that he had learned the secret of being content. And I'm asking you this evening, have you learned the secret of being content? Well, what is the meaning of content? Well, if you go to the Vines Expository Dictionary, it says, without covetousness, an inward sufficiency. And I think there's a phrase that is important to add to that, that it has nothing to do with accepting the status quo. So in other words, this is just the way things are going to be, and I just got to accept the way it's going to be. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that there is not a longing and desire for something else that in reality is not yours, but that there, there is a deep down satisfaction within yourself. I think it helps also to understand what the opposite of that is. Of course, the opposite is discontented, but that means disgruntled, unhappy, and full of resentment. Paul says, I have learned this. I, I want us to realize that this is not something that really comes natural with us. And I believe that there's a whole lot of things that has happened in the Apostle Paul's life that has brought him to this point that he can now say that I am content. That I have learned the secret of contentedness. And I think this is a lot like trying to get to sleep. You lay in there in bed and you want to go to sleep, and so that's all you think about. I want to go to sleep, I want to go to Well, when you're thinking like that, do you get it done? Not really. And I think the same thing would be true of contented. You're laying there and you're thinking, I want to be content, I want to be content, I want to be content. If you're really thinking about that, more than likely, that's not going to happen. Quite often, it is simply a byproduct of the things that you have gone through and you have learned. Well, there are some things that I want you to understand about contentment that I learned from this particular passage from the Apostle Paul. And there are a few things I want to point out. The first one is that Paul is confident in God's providence. He knows that God is leading him exactly where he wants him to go. That God is working out things in his life exactly as he would like for them to. In that 19th verse we read, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Whatever it is that you really need in order for you to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish in life, those things are going to be provided. There is no doubt about that within Paul's mind whatsoever. The fact is that the 
Philippians wanted to do more for Paul than what they had done. Now we don't know why, but we find that in verse 10 that they had no opportunity to show it. So there's possibilities. Maybe they've lost contact with Paul. You know, Paul was doing a lot of traveling around here and there and everywhere. Or maybe it's because they have been in such a deep poverty themselves that they were not able to help at that particular time. It may be that, well, we know where he's at, but we've not got anybody that can go and make that trip to him. Somewhere along the way, we see that they know where he's at. In fact, he's in a Roman prison where he's at. And now that you've got this man Epaphroditus that is going to carry this gift to him. So God did provide the way. And that's what simply Paul is saying. God will work things out for the very best. So first thing, have confidence in God's providence. The second thing, and this is a hard thing, and that is to be satisfied when you have little. I want you to think about that. If you had a, a lot smaller house than you have, could you be satisfied? If you had a lot fewer clothes than you have, could you be satisfied? If your car wasn't nearly as nice as it is, would you be satisfied? If your job only paid half of what you're getting right now, would you be satisfied? How content are you with your circumstances? There are two things that Paul says in here that he's referencing, and that is that there are times that he was hungry. Hungry. Have you ever been hungry and there was no food to eat? I can say in my lifetime that has never happened to me. Never once in my 64 years have I been hungry and there was nothing to eat. There's times the Apostle Paul was in that. But once you see, he says, I was content. The second phrase that he uses is that I was in want. So there are things that he felt like he needed or things that would certainly help him out. And they're not there. They're not there. He doesn't know where they're coming from. He doesn't know if they're going to ever come. And he says that he could find contentedness even in that situation. There's two or three other passages to think about along that line. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 11. Paul said, To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. Think about those things. Can't eat, can't drink, rags for clothes, treated badly, no home. That's how desperate things got for Paul sometimes. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 27. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. These are some circumstances that the Apostle Paul found himself in. And these are circumstances that you say he had very little. He did not have what we would think typically was necessary for life itself. Paul didn't have those. And yet Paul could say that I am content. Then I want you to also listen to what he said in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 through 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. I would ask, does that describe your life? If I had food and clothing, I would be content. That's how Paul could describe himself. The fact is that quite often the wealthiest people are the most miserable people around. They're not happy. They're discontented. They're miserable. I read this little illustration this week that points it out a lot of times. There was a rich businessman that noticed a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. And he asked him, why aren't you fishing? He said, because I've caught enough for today. So the man says, well, why don't you catch some more fish? He said, well, what would I do with them? Make more money, buy a better boat, catch more fish, buy better nets, catch more fish, have a fleet of boats, and be rich like me. 
Then what would I do? Then you could sit down and enjoy life. And the old fisherman said, What do you think I'm doing now? Kind of reminds me, my oldest son was 17 years old and still didn't have his driver's license. And there's some of his classmates starting to think, you know, what, what, what's going on here? And he said, well, if I get my driver's license and then if I get my car, then I got to go to work in order to pay for that car. And that's all I'll be doing is working. And I stopped and thought, you know what, he's right. And the day did come and he did get his driver's license, then he did get his first car, and then he ended up out there at Kroger's working hour after hour after hour after hour. Can we be content with what we have? It's a hard question, isn't it? It's an even harder thing to do. But I do believe that the Apostle Paul realized that his main purpose in life was to glorify God. So he was satisfied with whatever he had. The third thing I want us to realize is that this contentment comes about independent of our circumstances. He said, yeah, sometimes I had little, sometimes I had much. Sometimes I had almost no food. There are times that I had an abundance of food. It's not about your circumstances. Matter of fact, where is Paul as he's writing this letter to the Philippians? He's in prison. He's in Rome. He's chained to a Roman soldier. And I, I find people in commentaries saying this. And I don't know whether that's true then or not, but I, I find this written. You know, today, uh, one of the things people complain is about that prisoners get free room and board. Everything's provided for them. All the food, three meals a day. Well, from what I read, that wasn't the case then. If you were locked up, you were still dependent upon other people bringing you income or bringing you food in order for you to eat. Paul's in a miserable circumstance. And I've seen pictures which shows you what the Philippian jail looked like. And it's really just a little uh, crevice, a little cave-like that go back in there and they have uh, put those uh, stocks into the walls and then they put them around the, the individuals. So that's what uh, no doubt could have looked like when he was in Philippi, or Philippi years ago in Rome. Uh, he may have actually been in a house there, but he's chained to another soldier. So things are not good. Here's a man that the Jews have plotted to kill him. Here's a man that was stoned once and left for dead. Uh, he and Silas were in prison there in Philippi. Uh, he's going to be thrown into prison in Jerusalem and ends up uh, uh, challenging the statements that are made about him there and ends up in Rome, still in prison. And yet this man riding from prison to the church at Philippi saying, Be content. Would you be content in those circumstances? Paul says, I've learned that. The fourth thing is he has been strengthened by divine power. Verse 13 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Do you think along that line? Do you say, I can do everything through Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the one that gives me strength to get out of bed every morning and go do the things that I have to do. Maybe it's taking care of my husband or wife. Maybe it's taking care of those little children running around that house. Maybe it's going to a job. Whatever it might be, Jesus Christ can give you the strength to do what needs to be done daily, and He can give you the strength to serve Him no matter what you do day by day. First Timothy chapter 1 and verse, Paul, or verse 12, Paul says, I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who has given me strength, that He has considered me faithful, appointing me to His service. Paul knew that he really wasn't accomplishing all that he did. And isn't it amazing what this man accomplished in his life? But he knew that he was accomplishing not on his own willpower, but on the strength that God had given him. Another very interesting story is in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 17, where Paul is going to talk about the fact that he was rescued from the mouth of a lion. 
He says, the Lord stood by my side. You know what? Nobody else did. No other person did. But he says that the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear. So yes, he's rescued from that mouth of the lion. And what happens? He goes out and he continues preaching. Why? He says, because God has given me the strength. Another thing that I think is extremely important as we look at this passage is that Paul was preoccupied about the well-being of other people. There are several things in this passage that shows that he is thinking about these individuals at Philippi. In verse 14, he says, It was good of you to have shared in my troubles. So here they are in Philippi. Paul's over in Rome. But in Philippi, they're thinking about the circumstances that Paul is in. And they have taken up a gift, a collection, in order to send it over by Epaphras to Paul. Paul's saying, it was good of you to do that. He's gone to compliment them on their giving to his work. He says that they have set aside money time and again in order to benefit him like no other congregation had done. And he calls what they did a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, and with both of those phrases, he says it was pleasing to God. They were helping a man of God to do his work. Paul says that what you have done is going to be credited to your account. I love that phrase. And I believe the very same thing is true today, is that when you do acts of kindness and your money is given to support various different works or various individuals, this congregation... It's credited to your account as part of laying those treasures up in heaven above. Paul would say in here that he really wasn't in need. So then I asked this question, well, why did he take the gift then? He was thankful for it. He says, I've received full payment. So why did he take it? Well, that gift was a demonstration of their love. And I'd ask the grandparents that's listening right now, how many pictures do you have on your refrigerator that your grandchild has drawn for you? Are they up there because they are the greatest work of art? No. Why are they on your refrigerator? Because you love the one that drew that. And that's what I believe Paul is saying right here. Could he have survived without their gift? Yes. God would have provided somehow, some way, but he accepted that gift, and that gift did help him out, but he knew that gift was an act of love from them, and he was so appreciative of that. And the final thing that I would say to us today, if we want to learn to be content, is that we need to seek the eternal rather than the temporary. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Does that describe you? The more we think about heavenly things and spiritual things rather than earthly things, the easier it is going to be for us to be content. The fact is that the things of this world are passing away. One of my favorite passages in all of the New Testament. Thinking. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though inwardly we are wasting away. Or rather, outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What are your eyes fixed on? The more we can fix them on the spiritual, the things that are unseen, the more you will find contentment in this life. And so the Apostle Paul has gone to say that he has found contentment. I would ask you this evening, 
especially as we're going through some different circumstances in this day and time, have you found that contentment as well? I want to close this evening with the song, The Lord Bless You and Keep You, and that is our hope and our prayer that the Lord will bless and keep each and every one of us of our congregation. <laughs>